This is Twit. I'd like you to start, Pete, by uh, defining what we mean by laser illuminated projector. There are several different types, and uh, and how do they differ from good old xenon lamp based illuminated projectors? You bet. That's a very good question. And some people wonder why we call them laser illuminated projectors, sometimes abbreviated as LIPS. And the yes. reasons, and actually a lot of people just say, oh, that's a laser projector or a hybrid projector. The issue is that in the laser light show industry, which has been along, around a lot longer than we have in uh, uh, digital projectors, they have what they call laser projectors. And they're those things that shoot beams at the uh, Motley Fo uh, crew concerts and, uh, <laughs> and uh, get you all excited when you go out to the uh, to the rock shows, and that's not what we're talking about. I think everybody understands that, but that's the reason that laser illuminated projectors is a term, the kind of preferred term of reference to talk about these uh, digital projectors of a laser source. And you know, I, never, um, I never thought of that. That's very interesting. I mean, I used to go to the, the to the laserium shows here at the Griffith Observatory in Burbank in uh, L.A. Rather, uh, when I was a kid, when I was in high school, and. Uh, you know, I never thought about it. Sure, a laser projector, which is what I normally hear these things called, is something that actually projects laser light directly, uh, whereas a laser illuminated projector uses lasers as the illumination source, but they project an image. So uh, I'm glad exactly. to know that distinction. That's a distinction, and there's actually something in between, which is there are image projectors that use a scanning laser beam. Uh, they're not commonly on the market. There is um, a couple of companies, including Sony, had a technology called graded light valve, which yes, works very well for that. that. Yes, um, and that either took a single laser beam or it took a, a vertical stripe of lasers and scanned them left to right on the picture. Yep. And um, again, that was a, a perfectly decent technology. That's not what we're talking about. That proved to be commercially impractical. There's also some other safety concerns. So all the projectors that we're talking about are generating the image in the same way a lamp projector does. As a matter of fact, we even have a drawing that shows that. If we want to test out this um, theory, put up drawing one, if you would. Uh -huh. There you go. So um, we're going to start by looking at what a lamp-based projector does. Just as a reminder, in the left, you see there's a, a, a bulb, a lamp of some sort with a optical housing and reflector. Uh, there's an optical diffuser, which acts to spread that beam across a wide surface. And that's often done as an integrator rod or sometimes called a fly's eye. And then there's the image modulator itself, the spatial modulator, uh, typically a micro display such as a LCOS or a DMD device like a DLP or a, a liquid crystal and then out the lens. And it then is amplified or uh, expanded uh, to a magnification of up to a thousand times what the size of that micro display is. And that works very well and lamps have been used for ages. Now, if we go to the next drawing, we're gonna make this into a laser projector. How about that? All we did basically <laughs> is replace that lamp on the left with an array of red, green, and blue laser emitters, typically laser diodes. There could be several different flavors of those, but you're still going through that same kind of light combiner to turn it into white light and a diffuser, fly's eye integrator rod. And then it goes into the same sort of modulator panels, the spatial modulators, and then out the projector lens to the screen. So by the time you're outside in the auditorium, um, looking back at the projector lens, which we don't recommend for safety reasons, of course, the light is virtually indistinguishable from a lamp to a laser projector. So they really now, perform the same. Well, let me ask you a question here. Um, in that diagram, you have the th three colors of lasers, red, green, mm -hmm. and blue, and they are combined, essentially, mixed together to create white light. Um, so this diagram indicates. Now, I yes. was under the impression that... Uh, Commercial cinema projectors, anyway, are what we call three-chip, which means that there are three imagers, uh, one for the red component, one for the green component, one for the blue component. And so white light actually has to get separated into red, green, and blue to illuminate those three imagers. And after the imager, it gets combined together and out the, len uh, out the lens to the screen. Uh, is that not the case? That is the case. You're absolutely right. Excellent observation. Our diagram is greatly simplified. I should have made that clear. There are <laughs> single chip projectors, in which case they'll have a color wheel that time right. modulate the same thing. So temporarily, they'll create the red, green, and blue image separately. But if this was a digital cinema projector, you'd actually go through another separating prism 
with dichroic filters that would split the white light back into red, green, and blue bandwidths to each, go on each of the three modulator panels. And, and some people might listen to that and say, doesn't that sound really complicated? You start out with the red, green, and blue, you make mm -hmm. it into white, then you split it back apart. And the That's answer is yes. That was my next question. <laughs> that, that is kind of silly. But it depends. Do you want to use an existing projector and retrofit it from lamp to laser or use your same designs that your factory set up for? Or do you want to start from scratch and build it all over again? And it Got is it. very feasible to build a ground-up laser projector that doesn't need to use a dichro of filters to re-separate the red, green, and blue. But it's a very difficult, not difficult, but different optical path. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in fact, to, to Kodak be did that. And Kodak say, built a projector that, that uh, had the separate RGB channels without the dichroics. Oh, interesting. And how did it work? It actually worked very well. It's just that they it wasn't good timing for Kodak in terms of their other business activities. <laughs> well, that that's way. true. They're they're suffering pretty bad right now. So, okay, we'll, we'll leave that at that. Uh, go continue, please. Well, so uh, as, as you've pointed out before, Scott, there's a, another type of laser projector, sometimes confused, and that's on the third diagram. And in this case, what we're doing is taking, instead of those red, green, and blue lasers, we're taking an array of blues. I think if you go to the next one again. Um, and is. in this case, um, we're using blue lasers, and we're going to a phosphor element. It's a glass substrate with a combination of mineral phosphors. These are rare earth elements that glow. We know that no one loved them from our CRT days. And the combination of the yellowish phosphor with the original blue light that comes through the panel to a small degree creates a very nice um, broadband with white light source. And the rest of the projector is the same. It still has to go through that diffuser. It's going through um, the optical elements, the spatial modulator typically three of them, and then add the projector lens to the screen. And some people say, well, why? what's the difference? Well, why do I want one or the other? And the answer is that the blue lasers are very inexpensive. Blue laser diodes uh, are perhaps a tenth the price of what you'll pay for greens of equivalent value because uh, of Blu-ray discs. Uh, because Blu-ray players all use these, they've been largely commodified, now, these are different bandwidths. The Blu-rays typically use like a 405 nanometer, sort of a purplish blue, and these are more in the optical blue range of 445. But the Epitaxi, the manufacturing lines, all could be leveraged from the mass market. And therefore, I can get a lot of, of photons of blue energy. And phosphor, conveniently, happens to excite very well at those wavelengths. So I can mm. get a very efficient phosphor emission. It, it fills in the rest of the, broad, the, the broadband spectrum and allows a very good color rendition.